care on how do we bulletproof our Christian life. Uh, basically, uh, whether we can bulletproof our Christian life or not. And that is one uh, good point that I want to bring forth. It's basically uh, based on uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Okay, living a life that is victorious in uncertain time. Now, how do we live a life that is like that? Okay. But first, let me uh, talk about the title, how bulletproofing. Well, actually, there's no such thing as a bulletproof vest. Then you see that there's a, on the right side of the screen, there's a policeman with a bulletproof vest. Okay, because any... A uh, bulletproof vest is actually a uh, carbon fibers material that is smashed so that bullet cannot go through. I but, then, to, I do, do. Uh, but then bullets have, uh, people have been upgrading bullets. So you have hollow bullets and all that. And actually nowadays, the new bullets, you know, you can actually go through armor. So our bulletproof vest doesn't stop them anymore. So if you want to be really bulletproof, first thing is that don't get shot at then you're bulletproof. Okay, and if you get shot at, don't get, don't die. That's the only way. And I think that if we want to bulletproof our Christian life, either we have to avoid getting in situation where we are being shot at, or whether how we can recover from that. So let's start with the uh, word of God. In 2 Timothy, Okay, this is a letter that Paul is writing to uh, Timothy. Now, this is actually almost at the time of the end of his life. And uh, Timothy, you know, as his, his mentor. And, he, and Paul says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So you can imagine a uh, uh, more senior man talking to a young man and he says, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. So a lot of Christian teaching or Christian uh, training or Christian growth is caught by God. In other words, what we are learning from each other a lot of it is, yes, through teaching, through the mind, but also as we model to one another. As we look at one another and see how we behave and how we act in the world. That in, you, have said, you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will be also be qualified to teach others. In other words, what you have seen me do, what you have heard, also entrust to others, teach others, so that they will be qualified to teach others too. So there is an ongoing teaching program, ongoing apprentice program. It doesn't start with, it just mean, doesn't mean that only pastors can teach, only elders can teach. Everybody can teach. Join with me in suffering. Okay, so again, talking to Timothy, you know, and this is like the last word and what now for uh, famous last words is like what would if you are you want to summarize your life teaching to your mentor? How what would you want to tell your mentor? What would you tell your children? You know, as, a, as you end near the end of your life and you want to share your life wisdom with your children, what would you say? So Paul, this is what Paul says. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Okay, know, know that, you know, he used a metaphor because Jesus uses a lot of metaphors in his parables. He says, Timothy, this is my life teaching. You want to summarize what I'm going to teach you in one, in a nutshell, this is what that. Join with me in suffering. Be a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier get entangled 
in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown, except by competing according to the rules. Okay, so the second metaphor is an athlete, a runner, and a hardworking farmer should be the first to have to receive a share of the crops. So farmer, okay, again, a familiar uh, uh, metaphor because soldier, runner, and farmer. Farmer have a lot of faith because farmer knows that he has to depend on the weather to come at the right time. The rain doesn't come, the crops die. The rain comes too early, the crops die. When to plant, when to what. So the, the important to, to know that what Paul is living to Timothy is the idea of a soldier, idea of a runner, athlete, or right, and the idea of a farmer. So the three points I want to make uh, this evening is firstly, fight the good fight. Fight the good fight. Secondly, eyes on the finishing line, like the runner. And thirdly, keep the faith to the end. So, how, what is fight the good fight? Now you look at Ephesians chapter 6. Okay. There's a lot of talk about training and equipping. Because if we look at the, the idea of a soldier, okay, soldiers are trained, trained to fight and equipped to fight. And we are actually, uh, Paul, writing to Ephesians, talk about uh, the Roman soldier. Now, if you uh, read about the Roman soldiers, and uh, if you have an interest in the, the Roman soldiers, I have an interest in military history. And I find that the Roman soldiers were one of the best uh, well-trained army in the world at time. And because of the Roman soldiers, Rome became the superpower of that age. So when Paul talks and writes about and wrote about soldiers, okay, he has in mind the Roman soldier. And people who were listening to him understand what he actually means when they talk about the Roman soldier. So when Paul wrote to Ephesians, says, finally, okay, always when he finally, therefore, yes, uh, he is concluding and coming to the main point. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. And then he says, put on the full armor of God. Okay, when he says the full armor, they will have in mind the Roman army armor. The helmet with the flaps, the, the ladder, or if you are the officer, the metal ar armor. Okay, the metal breastplate. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. You have to realize that the way the Roman soldiers fight is not they just charge forward towards the enemy. They form a shield wall. That means the Romans, are, uh, they, all of them have a shield and they have a sword. And the Roman sword called the gladius is actually a short one. It's for short, uh, short distance uh, work. It's not, not like the, the uh, Gaul or the barbarians they have the long swords. So the Romans' way of fighting is to they form a shield wall where soldiers stand side by side and they form a wall. Okay, so that instead of going to the enemy, they form walls that is two or three layers uh, deep. So the enemies will charge towards them and break against the wall. Because 
when they hit the wall, they don't move. So they can stab the enemy with a short sword. But the enemy are crushed against the wall and they couldn't move and their long sword they cannot use. And that is the, the Roman tactics. So stand, take your stand against the devil's king. Because the enemies we fight, Paul referring again, is not against flesh and blood. Okay. So we have to realize that even in this time and place, okay, whether during the pandemic or before or after, we are fighting against enemies, not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So we are in a constant battle. That's why we need to fight the good fight. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil come, you will ever stand your ground after we have done everything to stand. So again, to stand. Let the enemy break against us. Stand firm with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the feet uh, fitted with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit and pray in the spirit on all occasions. Okay. So the whole armor of God is not only for individuals. Okay. Often we interpret it as for the individual Christian, but actually it's used in the plural. So it's also for the church. Okay. The church is to put on the armor of God. The Trinity Methodist Church is to put on the armor of God so that we can stand against the enemy. So our life as Christian, okay, we call it, we used to we use the word Christian soldiers, but we don't use anymore. It's about training and equipping. It's a lifelong process of as Christian, we should know. Knowing the word of God. And we should be disciplined about knowing the word of God. Okay. Let me share a bit about myself. Okay. Uh, I'm a medical doctor. Okay. I practice, uh, I'm a pediatrician, I'm a pediatric specialist. And also, uh, I teach in Monash University in pediatrics in a clinical school in Joe Baru. I'm from Joe Baru. Okay, so I spent about uh, five years in basic, uh, my basic degree, and then another uh, 10 years to a specialist training. Okay. And after that, I spent, I, I do part-time for, uh, with the ministry of, uh, uh, master ministry program where I met uh, your pastor, Joshua. Uh, That's part-time. So the, as, while working as a doctor, I also did a theological degree. Then I went on to do a PhD in theology, an AJST, also part-time, another seven years. Okay. So it is possible for us who are working to also do theological degree. Okay. It's not that because I'm smart, I'm, I'm actually not really that smart. Okay, always in class, in uh, as results, I usually uh, not at the bottom, but in the middle, never the first 10. Okay, but I'm smart enough to marry a smart girl. Okay, my wife is very smart, that's why my daughters are smart. Okay, but I'm just a, a bit stubborn. So I, I, that's why we can, and I believe that all of us can do some studies online, some theological training, so that we can know and rightly use the word of God. I think that, that is 
uh, uh, very useful. And now, with uh, many of the, almost all the seminaries <clears throat> going online, you can actually do courses online, part-time. Okay, I did my, uh, all my theological degrees part-time, online. Uh, not online, but part-time. So you can still hold a job and still do a theological education because you want to be equipped with the word of God. And there are a few things I always do every year. The beginning of every year, I always, uh, I have this uh, program of uh, trying to educate myself to be uh, competent, okay, to know the word of God. So what I try to do, okay, is to read through the Bible once a year. Okay, I, I mean, this is me. I, I'm not saying everybody should take one a, once a year, but everybody should read through the Bible. Okay, you can take three years, five years, doesn't matter. Important is that you need to read through the Bible at least once. Okay, so I try to read a different version every year. So I will try to finish the Bible. And this year, I'm uh, trying something new. I'm going through the audible Bible. That means instead of reading through the Bible, I'm listening to the Bible for the whole year. And I find that it's actually quite useful, quite interesting that, you know, instead of reading, I just listen. And I find that there are new ideas and new concepts that I sometimes miss if I read. So reading back through the Bible once a year. Okay. And every year, I make it a project to study a book of the Bible. That means I'll pick a book, like this year was uh, efficient or is efficient. And I'll buy all the commentaries and all that. I will read as much as I can about that particular book and study as much as I can. Okay, I've done uh, mo um, the, uh, most, many of the books of the Bible. My last project was uh, the Gospel of John. John took me, it was so good that it took me about five years to, to finish that. Then the third uh, project I use is to, every year I want to study a theological theme. So I've done atonement, uh, sanctification and all that. It's, it's my own personal study. I will read as much as I can. Now this year, I'm doing a, a theology of a person. Okay, the theology of uh, Eugene Peterson. I'm trying to read through all his words, his works and his writings, and his uh, uh, listen to all his uh, uh, lectures and all that. And then I try to learn something more about God by doing something, you know. Uh, I took up photography because I want to see the world in a different perspective different way of seeing the world. Because I think, I find the photography fascinating because it helps, you have to frame everything into this frame. So it means you have to see, it, it makes you see the world differently. So these are the five uh, projects I will give myself every year. So, and I think that we need to be intentional in our training equipping through our lives. It doesn't matter how young you are, or how old you are. Okay. And then we have to learn how to pray. Okay. I mean, we, we do pray. Okay. I mean, I'm sure that we all pray, but we need to do it. Okay. We often say we want to do it, but we will not have time. Now that we are all in lockdown, you do have the time. Is whether you want to spend time with it. So now uh, I'm using, uh, looking to take two hours a day just for prayer. Yeah, to pray through all the people I know, pray to the words, pray to the world events, and just finally to be in God's presence in silence. And you think means that you have to know God. Okay? It's not enough to just know the word of God. 
You can memorize the whole scripture, the whole Bible, and not know God at all. So I think it's important that in our training and equipping to fight the good fight, we must know God himself. Know God as a, we know each other, as a person. And I think that's so uh, important to know God as a presence. You see? And I find that uh, this uh, <clears throat> lockdown actually is a blessing to me because it's like a silent retreat. Okay. Yeah. At this moment, I'm locked down in JB alone. My family and my wife, my daughters and grandchildren are all in Singapore. So I'm all alone in JB, well, with my three dogs. But then it is a long period of silent retreat. And I think in this period, I'm taking this opportunity to really try to know God, to be silent before God, and the stillness come into God's presence. And also we need to know ourselves. Okay, more than and more, we really need to know who we really are, not the, the aspect that we put to the world, not the uh, aspect that we want to show the world, but who are we inside? Who are we really? The real self, not the false self that we put to the world. So that's the, the good fight that is, should, we should be training and equipping ourselves for to stand firm against the powers and the uh, principalities of this world. And the second aspect is to stand watch in Psalms 139. Okay? Soldiers are not always fighting. Most of the time, they are on guard duties. Like a watchman. That's why Psalms uh, 139 talks about the watchman. And to be a watchman is not easy, especially the night watch. You have, to, you have to keep awake or you fall asleep. And in the Roman army, if you fall asleep during guard duty, it's summary execution. So how do we stand with patience? And the watchman, especially a night watchman, will look for the dawn Look for the light, the sunrise, because then the wash is over. So my soul waits for the Lord. More than the watchman in the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman in the morning. So we wait for the Lord. In, okay, we wait for God that in our training and our equipping is to wait for the Lord. And I think that's important as we want to Bulletproof our life. We want to live a life that's worthy for Christ. Okay. And we have to remember that life is messy. Okay. Like all a general know. Whatever plan drop, the moment the battle starts, the plan is go away. And we know that our life is messy. Life is never easy, straightforward. That is why we need to keep training and equipping. It's keeping watch because life is messy. Life changes. Things, events changes. Okay. At this moment, I'm teaching a course uh, for <coughs> the Asia Graduate School of Theology for many students from doing their uh, Doctor of Ministry and PhD. And I, I love teaching this group of students because they're all uh, uh, lecturers and uh, uh, principals of seminaries. We have people from US, uh, from New Zealand, Samoa, you know, from uh, Japan, from Thailand, from Vietnam, from Malaysia, Singapore. So it's a, 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 a wonderful period of uh, uh, teaching them and uh, learning from them. And we are just learning about Christian spiritual formation or Christian growth. Okay, So that is what the good fight is all about. Growing in Christ, okay, Christian spiritual formation, which I will define as the intentional. It means we have to be intentional in our Christian growth. 
Okay, you, you cannot just relax and let it come like that. No, we have to be intentional. Ongoing process. All the time of inner transformation. Okay, not just mind, but heart to become like Jesus Christ himself, to be Christ-like. Not only that, but to become with others a communal people of God. So spiritual growth, the good fight is not just for one person individually. Okay, there's no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. Okay, we are not individualistic, we are personal. To become with others a communal people of God. And then to become an agent of God's redemptive purpose. In other words, we don't exist just for ourselves, but we exist both as an individual, as a community, and as a people with mission. That's why I talk about persons in formation, okay, or persons in growth in formation, persons in community formation because the community also grow, and also persons in mission formation because as a church, as a people of God, we have a mission. So we are restoring the image of God to become like Christ. We are uh, re redeeming the communion of, with the triune God to become a people of God. And we are doing shalom and the kingdom of God to, for the kingdom of God and the healing of all the world. And that is the purpose of fighting a good fight. That we do not box in the air. We do not do it because we have a purpose. We have a reason for doing that. And that's my first point. Okay. My second point is that we have to have eyes on the finishing line. Okay. We just, okay. So that means Christian life has a purpose. Our life on earth has a purpose. That's why when Paul writing to the Corinthians talks about intentional discipline. Okay. He says, that, I discipline my life like an athlete training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself may, might be disqualified. And I think it's so important to realize that we need to keep our eye on the goal and we need to keep on uh, disciplining our bodies. Keep on uh, 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 getting our, our doing the right thing, okay, so that even in our busy right life, we are our eyes are focused on the finishing line, okay. So, focus living now. This is Olympus. A uh, few years ago, I had a chance to visit Greece, and this is Olympia, okay. Olympia is the home in Greece, it's a city in Greece or a place in Greece. That is actually the home, the origin of the Olympic Games. Okay, we, we're going to have an Olympic Games in Tokyo okay, in a few months' time or a few weeks' time. But this is the origin place. This is the arch where the athletes go in. And this is the running track. Okay. In the past, okay, the running track is as it is. There are no, it's not paved. Okay. It's all uh, just dirt and dust. So can you imagine you have a group of people running? Okay, The dust will spur up and you can't see where you're going. So something I learned being in this place is that during the race, they will, they will have on the end, other end, the finishing line, you will have one of your person waving a color cloth. Okay, maybe a red cloth and all that, so that when there's a lot of dust, you can only see the color and you run towards the color. That is the focus living. That is the, the runner running towards the goal. And the goal, they cannot see the goal, cannot see the finishing line, but they can see the red cloth. So their goal is to reach the red cloth, the red cloth as fast as you can. So as Christian disciples, as we want to grow in Christ, as we want to have a life in Christ that is 
bear, food bearing, we must have mission and vision. What is your purpose in life? What's your purpose in Christ, in living here, in a few years that we have? I have a, a, a few years ago, I developed a, a, what we call a mission vision statement. Okay. And I decided then I would devote my life to that. And my vision mission statement is becoming and making followers of Jesus Christ. Okay. Becoming and making followers of Jesus Christ with informed mind, hearts on fire and contemplative in action. That means disciples of Jesus Christ, followers of Jesus Christ with informed mind, hearts on fire, and contemplative in action. And that is why I'm focusing all my energy doing that. And as I, I grow older, and the years uh, in front of me is less than years behind me, I want to still want to focus on that even more. So I'm doing uh, sort of uh, saying no to other activities that doesn't fulfill this mission and vision. And I think it's important for us that whether old or young or old, that you should have a mission or a mission statement, that you should know where you're going. Because you know where you're going, it's easy to go there. You don't know where you're going. You're just going around in circle without knowing it. And the eyes on the finishing line is very important about integrity and character formation. Because we live in a world that is full of temptation, that is full of uh, invitation to sin. And that's where we have to learn to resist sin. And I think that that is so, so very important that it always begins with small sins. Okay? We do not say one day we wake up and say, oh, I want to sin today. No, we don't do that. We begin with small sin. And then it goes on to bigger sins. Okay? I mean, uh, we begin with porn watching pornography. And then go on to uh, adultery goes on to sexual misconduct. It starts with small sins that we allow the small sins to come into our life. So it's so important to watch, uh, to be careful what you allow into your mind, what you watch on TV, on Netflix, on your or computer screen, or through the internet. Because what you watch and you read is incorporated into yourself, into your spiritual formation, whether you like it or not. So you see that people who sin doesn't awake and say, I want to sin. It starts with small things, small things that we allow. And then it slowly grow bigger and bigger and it takes over our life. As in gambling, you know, we start with small bets and then we go into online gambling. Now this is so easy to sin and you can hide it without people knowing. That's why it's so essential to have accountability okay, or accountability group that people can check on you, people who, uh, who you can trust and responsible enough to ask you the hard question. Okay. I have a group of uh, three other brothers who, are, who form what I call accountability group that we meet uh, once a month. And then we ask each other hard question. How is your soul? Do? Okay, how is your walk with God? Okay, how is your relation with your wife? Okay, so we meet and we ask this question and we answer the question and we share with each other, we honest with each other. Okay, and then one of them says, okay, Alex, I think you have not been uh, very uh, spending enough time with Agnes. That was Okay, you need to take her out for dinner and buy her a bouquet of roses. Okay, that, that was before the M MCO. So the next month we meet, you say, Alex, do you do it? Okay, 
show me your receipt. Because that is accountability. Not just uh, words alone, but deeds. We make accountable to each other. So that's why when I say I focus my life to doing what is my mission and vision statement. Okay? So all the invitations I uh, receive nowadays to preach and to teach and all that, I actually go channel through my accountability group and they will decide, yes, it will fit your, your mission and mission statement so you can accept. No, it cannot. Okay. Sometimes, you know, uh, ego is very strong. You know, I was once invited to, to uh, be the keynote speaker to a, 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 a meeting with 10,000 people. Wow, so I feel so nice, you know. I'm so important. But my accountability group says, no, doesn't fit your mission and mission statement. So you have to reject. <sighs> so with tears in my eyes, I write, I am so sorry, but I cannot. But that is accountability. That is how we have eyes on the finishing line. And on the news, okay, the a gentleman on the uh, left side of the screen is Ravi Zacharias. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm sure you heard about him, that he has been accused of uh, sexual misconduct and alleged rape. Okay, that in his time, I mean, he's a world famous apologist and he'd be going around, you know, spend almost a uh, whole part of the year traveling from uh, meetings to meetings, speaking and uh, writing books and all that. He's very famous. But <clears throat> he's accused of uh, uh, behaving inappropriately with uh, his uh, masuas, okay, the, the ladies who massage him. And uh, so usually in scandals like this, there are three, three parties. One, the the victims, and then the person who perpetuated the thing, and the organization. And I think that uh, all of them, in a way, is involved because you see that the a lot of these factors is during, due to his organization trying to protect him. Okay. But why does he fail? I, I, I met Ravi a few years ago when we both invited to, to preach uh, to teach, uh, to talk, give a talk in uh, Jakarta. And he's an excellent, well-mannered gentleman. And, you know, I, I, when I met him and I, I get to be correspondent afterward, and, you know, there was no indication at all that he has this uh, thing, uh, misconduct going on. Okay? And when he died, we felt very sorry. But then when the, all the facts, people start coming forth, accusing him of things. And uh, so where did that come in? I mean, he, he, he did so well. You know, I was, we were in uh, uh, Jakarta with uh, John Lennox. He's another apologist. And John Lennox also wasn't aware that he has this hidden problem. So <clears throat> sin can come in. The temptation, I mean, He's tired, you know, he's uh, uh, burned out because he's preaching and all this time and he's suffering from back pain. That's why he needs a massage. Okay, and when I met him, he was, he just recovered from back surgery. So, yes, there are justification. But also we have to be careful that we do not allow sin in. The gentleman on the right is Bill Hyber. Bill Hyber is the uh, founding pastor of Willow Creek Community Church, one of the biggest church in the world. And the Willow uh, Creek Association, which is teaching the pioneers of the secret church. And yet, he's been accused of sexual misconduct. And he has to resign uh, in 2019. <clears throat> So again, secret sin coming in, you know, a busy life. Okay. 
just have to note that uh, Ravi and uh, uh, Bill have never been accused of adultery. Okay, just sexual misconduct. The gentleman at the bottom is a well-known uh, spiritual writer and monk, uh, Thomas Merton. Okay. Well, Thomas Merton, everybody is uh, say, oh, such a great monk, such a great spiritual leader. But then, he actually had an affair while as a monk with a student nurse. And he has been be behaving a bit inappropriately while as a monk. So you see that sin will affect all of us. Okay? And if we're not careful, all of us will fall. That's why Proverbs says, guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. So it's not enough just to fight the good fight. Okay. You need to fight the good fight, but have your eye to the goal that you will live a pure and withstand and resist all temptation. Fight the good fight consistently and uh, constantly. It, 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 you know, the devil will attack us when not when we are strong, well rested, well fed, but when we are tired, when we are depressed, when we are suffering from pandemic fatigue. Then, that is where sin comes in. So how that we need to order our private world and live life in uncertain times. So. Now is a time that we need to be focused, especially in the world today where there's so much distraction. I think, you know, uh, I believe that ours is the most distracted generation in the whole history of mankind. Okay, now our minds are uh, so busy, our bodies are so busy that, you know, there are so many uh, connections and networking all over the world that it's so easy to lose focus. So easy to forget where you're going. That where is the finishing line. So take care of that. And do not allow yourself to be so distracted. So maybe you need, we need to re restrict our social media times. Okay. Our time that we spend on WhatsApp. And lastly, the third point is we need to keep the faith to the end. I think that's very important. Because, you know, it's not enough to have the good fight, not enough to keep your eye to go, but you need to keep your faith. That's why Paul says, keep the faith in First Timothy uh, 6. Paul said to Timothy, keep the faith, the faith that I see in your grandmother and in your mother and now in you. Keep the faith. And I, I always like John chapter 6. You know, it's about one third through the gospel of John. And uh, Jesus was telling the, all his disciples that, you know, the son of man is going to die on the cross. And the disciples say, eh, what? I thought you are going to... Uh, call in the legions of uh, angels and destroy the Roman Empire. You're not doing that. You're going to die. So all his disciples left him. And you see, imagine that on the mountaintop, all the disciples are leaving and Paul, Jesus was just standing there and turn around and say, oh, Peter is there. And he asked Peter, are you not going to go too? They are all going away. Are you not and Peter says, where should I go? Lord? You have the words of eternal life. I think it's powerful. Where shall I go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. To keep the faith to end, you must keep me nourishing the faith. That we help one another to be nourished in the faith. 
especially in times of persecution and suffering. Okay, and also to fight perversion of faith, that there are a lot of false teachers going around. Okay, especially during this pandemic period, you find that you know what's apps are full of false teaching. So we have to keep the faith and to finish well. It's easy to have faith when everything is going well. But we know that life is messy and life is suffering. Okay? And all of us, sooner or later, will encounter suffering. Okay? We always talk about people with disability as if they are one class apart. But I think that we should think about people without disability yet. Yet. Because all of us will have some disability sometime or other. Some may get disability early, have some diseases, have some uh, accident, and we lose a uh, uh, part of our body. But all of us, as we grow older, who we'll have aches and pain, who we'll have heart condition, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, you know, all these things are part of life. And some of us may even have dementia, forget who we are. Okay. One of my research at this moment is, who are we? if we don't remember who we are. Okay? Our identity is based on our personality, our memories. What happens if we lose our memories? If we lose our memories, we, we do not remember who we are. So who are we without our memories? Okay. I believe that even if we do not remember who we are, God remembers us. And that is faith. That our faith will be there until the end. Okay, so, so be prepared for suffering. Is you not know, be prepared for suffering. But prepared, be determined, or be consistent, or be resolved now that you will end your finish well, finish your faith. Because you find that many Christians begin well, but do not finish well, which is sad. Because, you know, the, the early part of the Christian life and all that, they're doing so much for God, for the church, they're so active in church, and then they fall away. So we must finish well. And if you look at Paul again, Talking to Timothy, he says, For I'm already been poured out like a drink offering. And a time of my departure is near. Okay, remember Paul talking to Timothy? I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. The soldier, the runner, and the farmer. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me to that on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. So how do you bulletproof your life? Fight the good fight. Eyes on the finishing line. And keep faith to the end. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for this time, this opportunity to listen to your word, listen to your spirit, reminding us again of being like a soldier to fight the good fight. Of being like a runner 
pressing on towards the goal. And not being a farmer, have faith. Father, we just want to commit each one of us that we will all end well, that we will end in faith. Thank you.